Who would have guessed that within weeks of the first coronavirus case being reported, every journalist on the planet would be covering the same story? COVID-19 set the news media ablaze with an all-consuming focus and perhaps no other story in history has ever received as much relentless, round-the-clock coverage as this. And at a time when people's need for information has never been greater, the reporting itself has come under intense scrutiny as well. I'm Ali Aslan. Welcome to the final edition of Corona Times. In concluding our 10-part series, we look at the performance and impact of global media coverage about the coronavirus. Has the pandemic changed the very nature of journalism? And what lasting impact could those changes have for the media business? Today's panel of journalists are uniquely positioned to share their insights on what lessons they've learned and on what might lay ahead. But first, Haider Abbasi takes a look at what a post-pandemic media world might look like. The pandemic has forced the world to adapt, and that includes the news industry. Journalists have had to make significant changes to the way they operate, but perhaps more importantly, to the way they approach stories. Reporting the truth and challenging power has never been more difficult. From China to Hungary, governments have exploited the pandemic to restrict press freedoms and consolidate power. And some countries have been accused of trying to hide the true impact of COVID-19 on their populations. Journalists have also had to contend with the so-called infodemic, conspiracy theories about the origins of the novel coronavirus and how it spreads. The press has been forced to be more careful in checking facts and verifying sources. Reporting the correct information in this pandemic can be the difference between life and death. Journalists around the world have also shown that despite working remotely, they're still able to produce groundbreaking stories. And some have taken the greatest risk, reporting from intensive care units filled with infected patients. The result has been a spike in readers and viewers. Yet, like many other businesses, the news industry is suffering. Thousands of journalists have been laid off, mainly because of a loss in advertising sales. Newsrooms and reporters have shown they can adapt and be innovative in the face of constraints. But will that be enough for journalism as we know it to survive? Or has the coronavirus changed news forever? Haider Abbasi, TRT World. Well, to discuss this, joining me now from Brussels is Stephen Erlanger. He's the New York Times chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe. In Paris, we have Anne-Elizabeth Moutet. She's a columnist for The Telegraph. And in Alexandria, Virginia, is Steve Herman, the White House bureau chief for Voice of America. Stephen Erlanger, these have been extraordinary times, no doubt, for the entire world, but for news organizations and journalists such as yourself as well. Looking back at the previous months, what stands out for you? What's your overall take and assessment of media coverage? Well, first of all, confusion. Um, we've been dealing with something we haven't really dealt with. I mean, it's not 1918. It's not SARS, MERS. Um, we've had a worldwide pandemic. And um, journalists like governments have been struggling to figure out how to manage it, how to manage themselves, how to manage their lives, how to cover it, how to give people accurate information, even when uh, scientists and epidemiologists don't always agree. So I, I think we've done our best in the way journalism does, fumbling our way toward the truth day, day by day, making some mistakes, but trying to fix them, and learning a lot, I think, about our readers and perhaps ourselves. A complex story without a doubt. And Elizabeth Moutet, we sort of stumbled across the line here, says Stephen Erlanger. What's, what's your take? Well, all, everything that Steve says is absolutely true. I would add to this the fact that, the, as was explained in your, in your uh, 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 presenting uh, segment, 
um, the, 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 at the very time when it's difficult to report, we've been hampered not just by the fact that we have had to do a lot of this from our homes, most of us, and some people had to take risks, but also the fact that suddenly the, 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 the many tap was uh, shut off to our organizations, and they felt it immediately. And, and the result is that uh, opinion doesn't cost anything, but facts cost a lot of money. You have to send people out. They have to be several. You've got to pay them during the time that they investigate before they can present something of any value. And just at the very moment when we had to look at many things, from uh, uh, the political ramifications to the fact that not only countries, but uh, the World Health Organization itself seemed to be uh, deceitful, uh, we need to have teams of people investigating, and that was the time when they had neither the means uh, uh, um, uh, to, to investigate um, nor the, uh, the access that they normally might have had. So all of this is very difficult to cultivate sources over Zoom. So all of this made it much more difficult. Yeah, indeed. New innovations, new ways of reporting and interviewing such as this has become somewhat the norm. Steve Herman, you're obviously based in the U.S., the country, one of the country's most hardest hit. Uh, uh, from the coronavirus, as far as the reporting and media coverage is concerned, how would you evaluate and assess the previous few months? Well, I think there was a very uh, steep uh, learning curve. I mean, we're a lot of us are just uh, general journalists covering uh, politics, uh, foreign affairs. We're not epidemiologists or physicians, and uh, everything was uh, disrupted, as um, as you pointed out, uh, with um, most of us having to work remotely. Uh, I cover the White House, and uh, we have still been going into the White House, and I have to admit that at times I've felt more apprehensive about going into the White House as a risk to personal safety than, uh, than in previously going into some combat zones, uh, especially because of the uh, confusion and mixed messaging coming from the United States government itself, including the White House, about uh, just how dangerous and extensive uh, uh, the situation was. Stephen Erlanger, uh, the White House certainly one of the hotspots we focused on, but overall the entire globe obviously has been affected. You're based in Brussels covering Europe, also a continent that has not been spared by the virus in any shape or form. As far as the media coverage is concerned, what has been the main lesson for you standing out? Well, I think it's the problem of foresight. Um, we watched what was going on in China, somehow didn't imagine that it would come in the way it came to the rest of the world. It was like some Asian science fiction movie. And when it did come, particularly in northern Italy, first inside Europe, which is a very wealthy, well-provisioned um, well part of Europe, um, its impact was really shocking. Um, and I think journalists have been very brave. Um, they have struggled um, with the facts. They have struggled certainly with resources, finding personal protective equipment, managing to talk, managing to bring humanity to both to the people who are losing their lives and the people who are trying to, to save them at great risk. And I think part of what we do best is tell stories, um, stories that, that make people feel they're part of a larger whole, which they are here. And then again, in Europe, what you saw was, was tremendous confusion and, and an upsurge of, of what would only be called nationalism, people shutting borders, people stopping exports of masks, um, China and the U.S. competing uh, for some sort of leadership, as if leadership's really the issue here. Um, you have all the faults of the societies that we cover already there, have all seem to have been accelerated by this virus, and also capturing the panic of people. I mean, the virus, um, it's, it was quiet, it was invisible, it was hidden, it couldn't be seen. It, it sort of lent itself to a kind of anxiety that emptied our cities, emptied our museums, um, kept us at home as if some authoritarian government had sort of banned any movement. And we did it to ourselves voluntarily. So now we have to think about how we unlock, 
what's safe, what isn't, and what the implications will be for so many things, not just politics. The implications but, as we move forward, of course, uh, as normalcy is starting to come back into our lives, regardless where we are. And Elizabeth, if you look back at the previous few months, what stands out for you, perhaps also personally, what has been your main challenge in reporting about this pandemic? The main challenge was not to, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a situation in which you need to have both responsible reporting. And I always hate being told that I have to be a responsible reporter. I have, uh, I'm responsible to get the facts, but uh, here you had the point that the, the, the entire thing was something that threatened everyone. And so uh, that, was, that was a challenge in itself. Uh, the other thing was really um, uh, in France, because I report out of France, uh, what was fascinating is that the uh, uh, the political footballs and the medical footballs used in, in political terms were something big. Steve's paper, the New York Times, has profiled the, the personality who emerged from this crisis, who is pro Professor uh, um, Didier Raoult, who is the man who found, well, who uh, uh, proposed and used the treatment of hydroxychloroquine uh, added to antibiotic, which was uh, 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 went, you know, the idea went worldwide. President Trump mentioned it in a press conference, and in France, he became a kind of figurehead, not necessarily, not voluntarily, but well. He's got a ma massive ego, but he became a figurehead for the Yellow Vest movement, for anybody who disliked the government. And the whole point was, on the one hand, you had a scientific uh, proposal from somebody who is well known in the world of science uh, and who uh, tried something, saying better do something than do nothing at all when there's such an emergency and uh, better peer-reviewed uh, studies will follow. And people who said for reasons of their own that they didn't want to, they didn't want to follow him. In France, you had a medical establishment which was not trying to hide anything, but which is pretty bureaucratic and hidebound because that's the French way. And you had this maverick who was playing at being a maverick, and at the same time, he had a, a very important part in trying to sort of unravel the French politics, the world politics of this, the actual medical uh, truth uh, about this, and the treatment itself is still unproven, although it's been apparently efficient in some cases, but not enough to say it has to be advocated in a press conference at the White House. That was a challenge. And to some extent, it was a very interesting challenge. Steve Herman, when it comes to challenges, there's certainly no shortages of stories. I'm sure that you can tell as the White House correspondent of Voice of America. As Anne Elizabeth said, this story is for, first and foremost a medical story, a story for scientists, but it's been heavily politicized, hasn't it? Well, I think we absolutely saw that at the White House with uh, President Trump himself trying to be front and center most every day and overshadowing uh, the medical experts. Uh, I can tell you, attending these news conferences, we had a lot of questions uh, for them. They had the answers, we felt, for what uh, the American people and the world wanted to know on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, in a way, the president was sort of shoving them aside and making his own pronouncements, uh, uh, some of which were quite uh, uh, medically dubious. And that shifted the story and uh, essentially took us away from the science. It was a, a huge distraction and uh, made covering this um, even more difficult. Stephen Erlanger, uh, it's always easier to play Monday morning quarterback uh, now knowing everything we do now in May uh, than we did back in January or February. But knowing everything we do now, um, what do you think could have done differently? What do you think journalists should have done differently when reporting and covering this pandemic? It's a very hard thing to say because a lot of people did a lot of really good work and some people did some really bad work. And, you, you know, it's hard to talk collectively. I think we risk boring people to death on the topic, frankly. Um, the hard part is, is getting the proportionality of this pandemic correct in regard to the other real issues that matter, like the economy and this increase in debt and the inequalities in our society and the fact that in, 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 in America, certainly more blacks and people of color are dying from it. Why is that? Um, so that I, I think we've um, perhaps need to learn better how to prioritize what really matters underneath the story. It's a constant problem with 
um, journalism, and it's you know I have every sympathy for um, for Steve in Washington. I mean, you're trying to do your job in the White House, and the president wants to get reelected, and he's spending a certain amount of time yelling at the journalists. I mean, he's yelling at China, he's yelling at his own people, he's yelling at um, at the um, WHO itself, which he just pulled out of. So, you know, everybody's trying to deflect blame. Our job is not so much to be the judge, but to explain context and explain that there really are lots of other issues that are at stake here, um, other than just the fact of this virus. And Elizabeth Mute, Steve Nelanga just touched upon a very key element and word, proportionality. Do you think we got that right? Did we think, do you think we, we did too much of the story or we focused on too many different and wrong angles? I think, I mean, I would be less severe because I think this is a job that you do, you know, we, we were learning as we were doing. We had to cover everything because people were stuck in all that. There was practically nobody on this planet who was not affected. It's, I've never been on a story like this. Uh, and uh, we did all the angles that we could, and certainly we should learn from the proportion. I mean, uh, Stephen Allinger and myself, we write uh, we do print mostly. So yes, we have to think about what space we give it. In terms of all day news and, and television, you had to cover whatever was thrown at you at that time. Uh, the following day, you think, okay, the story is not finished. It's not. We don't know when it's going to be over, and you try to correct. Uh, but I would be, I would be sort of saying. Uh, there's not much you can do except that try and report the news and see uh, how it evolves at the same time. And that means if you're doing uh, if you're doing television news, that means that you correct with the net the next report. And in writing, same thing. There have been lots of instances in my life when I did a story and then I looked back, the story was over, and I thought, well, I should have seen that. Well, unfortunately, in terms of the coronavirus, it's not over. We can correct as we go. It's not finished. It's still not finished, indeed, uh, Stephen Herman. If we look at the main challenges that journalists had to face reporting on a mainly scientific story while playing watchdog of politicians while also trying to debunk fake news out there. It's almost too much to take on, no? Yes, it was coming at us uh, from all angles. As Steve uh, pointed out, this wasn't only a medical story, it's a sociological story, it's a geopolitical story, it's an economic story. and. Uh, what we did uh, with our 47 language services and our global audiences is uh, marshal all of our resources. And what we found is there was really an insatiable appetite for all this. Uh, uh, the, the stories that we did about uh, COVID uh, got more traffic online and uh, there was, seemed to be a limitless appetite for it. Uh, and the battle against disinformation is extremely notable. Of course, this has been going on for some years. But uh, what we've uh, found out is there's been a lot of uh, dis deliberate uh, uh, misinformation uh, put out there, especially on social media. Some of it uh, coming from places such as Macedonia in the Philippines. And uh, uh, th there are probably more stories to be done about uh, who's behind this and, and what their goal is. Uh, and the problem is, is people are looking at us for credible information and they're balancing against these more sensational stories that they see coming on their Facebook feed, for example, and uh, equate uh, the New York Times with something that's uh, been uh, invented in a, in a troll factory in, in Eastern Europe. And we need to do a much better job of putting our stories into context and explaining why our information is more credible than some of the more sensationalistic and false stories that they're seeing online. Stephen Erlanger, in the remaining time, let's look ahead uh, about, uh, let's look at the future of uh, journalism. Um, now, obviously, ad revenues are down. We're seeing layoffs all across the board with many companies. News organizations certainly are no exception here. What do you foresee? How has this pandemic changed the reporting and the nature of the media industry? Well, first I'd say about the industry, I worry some of these shifts will continue. Um, companies are in trouble. Our economies are shrinking 10%, 15%. Um, and some of these companies may not come back to advertising in the same way. I'm very struck by what we thought was the future of journalism, which was entirely digital, places like BuzzFeed and Vice and Vox. 
I mean, they're the ones that have had the biggest trouble because digital advertising has simply cratered. And, and, and companies more like ours, which at least made a bet that they would be more predominantly a subscription service, that we could get people to pay for what we do and spend less dependency on advertising, so far so good, but it, this will go on for some time. That's the sort of business end. And professionally, you know, I, I think, you know, in general, we've done well. I just want us to look at, in the future at how people have manipulated, particularly politicians, have manipulated this crisis to consolidate power. And here I'm thinking of Hungary, perhaps Poland, even Washington, um, other places. Uh, Putin is a really interesting story, how Russia will um, come out of this, even Turkey. So, you know, we need to keep our eyes open and we need to be ready for a second wave of this virus, which may come, it, you know, if we unlock too quickly or too haphazardly. And Elizabeth Moutet, what is your final take? What is your prediction about uh, the post-COVID era of journalism, both in terms of coverage, but also the industry? Um, well, the industry, I think Steve has said most of it. I would say in terms of coverage, we all have to learn economics pretty fast because we are facing uh, the worst uh, economic depression in memory. Uh, and people say since, you know, since the uh, Great Depression in 1929 and onwards, uh, but to, to a large extent, it's going to be even worse than that. And I suspect that that is really, that's going to be the story and that's going to be the choices of, of, of big business, of governments, the temptation of state intervention everywhere. Uh, the effect of this on Brexit, which uh, will have an effect on Europe because Europe did not uh, always cover itself with glory at the time of the virus. We can see that Germany has now said that uh, those countries like Italy who've been hit first should should be held and the the divisions of Europe uh, uh, between the northern states and the southern states will probably have political consequences in terms of justifying the the uh, the idea that uh, when when push comes to shove and when a real crisis hits the European Union is not as useful as it showed itself so economics and politics being uh, mashed together, uh, massive unemployment, the possibility for populists uh, to take over in a much more uh, 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 visible way and, and elections coming practically everywhere. So I, you know, I think we, as journalists, we'll have plenty of work to do. Um, it's more a question is also uh, going beyond the cliches because it's going to be incredibly easy. I've, just heard Steve say we've had a grab for power in places like Poland and Hungary. In terms of Hungary, that the state of emergency is stopping in 20 days because the government has announced it. Um, and the French law uh, is a more stringent law in terms of public liberties than the, than the Hungarian law. So um, we will have to look at things without prejudice, I think. Stephen Herman, uh, your predictions for uh, the post-COVID, post-corona journalism, but also the way we do business and the way fin financially, of course. Well, I think post-COVID is still a way off. Uh, perhaps uh, you're going to end up doing um, a, a second season of uh, this 10-part uh, uh, series uh, because uh, all indications are that uh, we may not even be over the first wave. We may have another peak with it. Uh, there's uh, certainly going to be a, a, a second wave uh, before we get uh, widespread uh, inoculations. And in the meantime, if we continue to have these uh, uh, rolling economic and political changes, uh, it's really unpredictable what's going to happen. Right now in the Washington, D.C. area, things are opening up slowly, but people are very hesitant to go back. And uh, that that's going to be a huge economic problem that uh, theoretically, if things are open, uh, but if people aren't uh, going back to, to restaurants and bars and traveling and spending money, uh, that's going to exacerbate uh, the situation. Uh, I don't think any of us can predict the future, even say six months, a year from now, what the world is going to be looking like and uh, how far along we're going to be in this uh, uh, battle against uh, this uh, deadly infection. And uh, the one thing seems to be clear and undeniable, this pandemic, this virus, has changed and challenged journalism, certainly in a way where we will find uh, it uh, tackling the challenges coming 
forward. Thank you so much to Stephen Erlanger and Elizabeth Mute and Steve Herman for your insights and the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And with that, we close this final edition of Corona Times. For the last 10 weeks, we've held a mirror up to the media industry's coverage of the global pandemic. From censorship to fake news and from the front lines to the boardrooms. We've raised controversial issues and asked the hard questions. Our aim has been to help us all navigate the vast amount of information out there and to shine a light on how we as journalists are doing our job and to keep us accountable. From me, Ali Aslan and the team here in Istanbul, thanks for watching, stay healthy and stay safe.